how should I think as an American about vaccines and whether they are good or not? Because there's crackpots and cranks everywhere, including at the heights of the medical establishment, it, it appears. That's a tough question, right? So just, let's just stick for right now with the COVID vaccines, right? So that, uh, that if there had been an open discussion allowed around it, uh, that it would have been very clear, I think, to most doctors and most parents that the benefit of the vaccine for the COVID vaccine for young people, especially, especially children, uh, was very, very small. Why? Because the mortality risk of dying from COVID for children was very, very small. So it's the, 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 you reduce a small mortality risk to an even smaller mortality risk, you're not getting very much benefit. That is enough to say that any possibility of side effects in that group would lead you to say, don't use that product in that group. In fact, Martin Kulldorff and I wrote an op-ed in The Hill, I think, in April of 2021, recommending against younger people taking the vaccine for that, with exactly that reasoning. Uh, the, there were evidence coming out already around then that young men especially got high rates of myocarditis, in part inflammation, when they took the vaccine, with the COVID vaccine. And so the question then is what, what benefit is there to, the, to, to, to my child from taking it? Uh, that's the first question. Yeah. Like if, it's, if it's potentially large, then you want to consider it. If it's not potentially large, uh, it, then you, you, want to, you want to be more, more careful about it. Uh, the flip side of the old for the older population, there's a much higher risk of dying, and you're reducing the risk of di of, the, of getting sick with the, the disease. You're probably gonna you have a much wider range of like how much benefit that could be, and you're going to be willing to, to allow there to be. I, at least I should speak for myself personally. If I'm going to get gain a lot of benefit and expectation, and I'm going to be willing to take some risk, I'm going to allow there to be some har uh, potential harms, if they're, especially if they're low risk. Um, low, low probability, and I'll still take the thing because I expect to have more benefit than harm, right? So that's the that's the base of the recommendation to, for older people to take the vaccine. Uh, if somebody tells you that there's a uniform risk and you know there's not a uniform risk, if somebody exaggerates to you the nature of the risk on either side, you know, the, taking the vaccine or not taking the vaccine, and you can you can get a sense of like, are they alarmist? Are they are they are they are they reasonable? Are they balanced? Are they are they accounting for uh, other people disagreeing with them? What do they have to say about the people that disagree with them? Th then you should be very careful about believing them about the, the nature of the risk that they're trying to evaluate for you. Second, I don't think that you as as a parent. Um, I mean, I do think that there's some some there's it's, it's very difficult, right? So. Uh, like the, 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 let's just, now let's leave COVID vaccines aside. Let's move to the childhood vaccine schedule. I do want to, I do want to ask one follow-up question before we expand on the other, you know, MMRs and all the rest. So there's death, but then there's other stuff, right? That's not death, but, um, is in the middle. So taking the vaccine appears to have increased myocarditis risk with young men. Like my son was of age, of that age in that target at the time when the COVID vaccines were really getting pushed. But what did we know about what, if you got COVID? Like, so if my son got COVID, survived just fine, did, did that also elevate myocarditis? Did it elevate myocarditis risks? higher than if he had taken the vaccine? So the myocarditis is, is the, the calculus around myocarditis is really interesting. Uh, so yes, COVID can cause myocarditis. It ha did cause myocarditis in, 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 in people. Absolutely it did. Um, the, the, uh, the question though, isn't the relative risk of myocarditis for COVID versus the vaccine. The question is, if I take the vaccine, what's the marginal impact on my likelihood of getting COVID? And what's the marginal impact of, on the likelihood of getting myocarditis if I get COVID, right? So marginal meaning if I take it versus if I don't, what's the change in the likelihood of getting COVID? It turns out that it prevents you from getting infected, symptomatic infection for, for two months, but it that declines very sharply after f just two or three months, right? So you, it doesn't really prevent you from getting COVID. You're very likely to get COVID afterwards. I got the shot, the Pfizer shot. I've I've had COVID twice since, as an example, <laughs> personally. Yep. 
I, I mean, I got the I got the two Pfizer shots in April 2021, and in August 2021, I got COVID. <laughs> I, I, you know, it's so the marginal impact of on the likelihood of getting COVID, and therefore the myocarditis associated with the COVID is still basically the same. The marginal impact of the vaccine on so because you still get so you take the shot and then you still get COVID anyway. So whatever COVID was going to do to you, it's still going to do to you. Yeah, or, it's like two draws on the myocarditis, uh, you know, slot slot machine, right? So, I mean, COVID is an it's a it's a terrible thing, right? It's not like it's nice to have COVID. I, I wish we didn't have it around, but that doesn't bias anything, right? Right. Um, okay, so uh, the 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 there's that. <laughs> I, I have to say, I think for young men, the risk of myocarditis from the vaccine is higher than the risk of myocarditis from from COVID, uh, for older people, it's less. Really? So it really was the yeah. case that if you gave your, if you gave your teenage son the shot, you were putting, you were perhaps putting them at higher risk of myocarditis than just letting them go play basketball and get COVID from their buddies sweating on each other. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of arguments in the literature about this, but somewhere between one in 2000 and one in 10,000 of young men who got the vaccine, COVID vaccine, got myocarditis. I mean, that's too many, especially yeah. since the benefit from the vaccine for them was minuscule. There is this question, though, about what to do more broadly with, with our kids and with vaccination. And I, in general, maybe it's just because my dad's a doctor, traditional MD, I have usually been like, I ask my dad, what should I get? He says, get the standard kind of thing. And I go do it without much reservation. When we had our son, my wife was more skeptical. And so I, you know, going all the way back, my son's 19, you know, I looked into this thing of, well, do, I, do vaccines cause autism? Which was a claim. I was even in my doctor's office because we had sort of a, crun a little bit of a crunchy granola doc which my wife picks and he was telling a patient vaccines cause autism do vaccines cause autism okay so first of all let me unpack that question right so there's multiple vaccines m many of them uh and the question is not do vaccines as a class cause autism but the do the particular vaccines that are recommended to, to be given to children cause autism like measles like one, mumps rubella and and such gotta, right you got to you answer the question one at a time now the allegation the idea that the that the the, the, the vaccines cause autism actually came out of uh the, the first time i heard of it was a study in the lancet uh which is a very famous british medical journal a small tiny study with i think inadequate kind of uh kind of kind of methodology that found that there was some correlation it's a study that it's the kind of study that would normally be published in some like some journal no one's heard of, and then there would be there have to be much larger and larger investigations before you study. But it was published in a very top medical journal, and it caused a lot of people to think that the MMR vaccine, measles, mumps, rubella vaccine, causes autism. Now, work that has been done subsequent to that, not randomized work, but like large scale population epidemiological studies of the sort that I deem as credible in the Netherlands by groups that are not conflicted have found no correlation of the MMR vaccine and subsequent autism in, uh, using population scale data. So I don't believe the MMR vaccine causes autism. Now, it's not randomized. So, uh, you know, I've tell, I've tell my friends who, who are much more skeptical of vaccines than I am that this, and they're like, well, it's not randomized. And my answer is, yeah, right. I don't, I know. I, yes, you're right. It's not randomized. I wish it, we had a randomized study that concluded that, but it's hard to conclude a negative from a randomized study sometimes. And so it, we, and we don't have that. It's also hard to convince doctors to run a study for a intervention like the MMR vaccine that almost every doctor believes is, is worthwhile to do and then say, okay, I'm going to randomize some kid to not get it. Right. That, so that just would be deep. so I understand this to continue, because the listener who's skeptical, who's made it to this point, and is like, okay, now we're getting into the stuff I'm worried about for my newborn. Um, if most doctors believe MMR will prevent measles and mumps and rubella, but measles is pretty like these are not good things. They 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 can be 
quite harmful. Not giving kids the, the shot feels like it might be almost child abuse. If you believe as a doctor that this will prevent kids from getting harmful diseases and it works and it's well established. So to, to do the right, is that right? So to do the control trial, you'd have to intentionally follow kids that go unvaccinated and see how many of them get measles, mumps, rubella versus the vaccinated set. Is that right? That's, ex that's exactly right. And no um, one, it, it very be, few have been willing to do that or nobody's, has, has anybody been willing to do that? I mean, what would happen is you'd go to a, if, if you were to, if I were to propose such a study, and I wouldn't because I'd work on other things, but like if I were to go to a, a, try to propose such a study, if I could get funding for the study, I would have to show it to a human subjects review board, which whose job it is to protect the subjects of the study. And they tell me that it, it's an unethical control arm, that I'm not allowed to run the study. Hmm. Um, okay, so that's okay. That, but so the next best thing are these large scale population wide careful carefully controlled epidemiological databases where you match people that are very similar to each other at similar ages. Uh, some I mean just in reality some people don't get the vaccine, and you track them oh. retrospectively you know, prospectively and see what happens to them. I didn't tell them not to get the vaccine; they just happen to not get it. I have they, I capture them in my database and I, I go forward and ask. Are the people, the kids that were vaccinated, more likely to get autism diagnoses later on than the kids that are not? And the large-scale studies in, like, in Denmark found in, like, a 2000, in, in the year 2000, no. The answer is no. They're equally likely to get an autism diagnosis. Um, there's some there are more complications here than this. So uh, <laughs> let me just tell you a couple of complications. Uh, okay. So one, measles, mumps, and rubella are very bad if kids get it bad for kids to get it, right? It, uh, it can cause death in the kids. But it's very uncommon in part because of the success of the vaccination programs. So the marginal benefit in a population that's largely vaccinated to any particular child getting vaccinated is actually, is actually small. But if everyone were to choose to do that, then measles, mumps, rubella would come back and you would have the marginal benefit get higher. So right, what because, you have is I can choose not to get the MMR and go and my, my, my risks are low because I'm free riding on a herd immunity that because most people get it. Exactly. The other th aspect of it is there's a very talented epidemiologist in Denmark. Her name is Christine Stable Ben. She has done some really interesting work asking whether vaccine uh, that are live attenuated vaccines, what impact do they have on, on things that are not targeted by the vaccine in terms of the health of the child? And it turns out that live atten in her work, live attenuated vaccines reduce the risk of mortality from other diseases, not just related to the thing that you're supposed to detect. Right? So for instance, the oral polio vaccine, which is not the version that's given in the US, is given in Africa, in her work in Africa, finds that it reduces all-cause mortality for children in randomized studies that get the oral polio vaccine versus who don't. Other vaccines that are not live attenuated vaccines do not have that, 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 do not have that result. Right? What does so that mean, DBT live? You mean like the virus is alive instead of dead? Yes. Right. The virus, the virus uh, replicates inside of you. But, uh, so there's like two kinds of vaccines. One kind of vaccine... You give, them a, you give a, a pathogen that's similar to the thing you want to prevent, that's still alive, you get a you know, mild version of the sickness, and then you're better. Uh, and then you're now protected against if you were to get, you know, if you're, if you're subject to polio, if you, if you, if, then you're not going to get it because you've already had that, that attenuated version of it. Um, the other version of the vaccines are essentially dead parts of it. So that's what co the COVID vaccine is, is an example of this. It's not supposed to, it's just producing the spike protein. It's not producing live virus that can replicate inside of you. And it trains your body to react to that part that it's exposed, not to the entire live virus, right? If you like this clip, we've got so much more where that came from. So be sure to hit that like button, subscribe to the channel and ring the bell so you won't miss our new videos as they come out each week.